Rabbi Sachs, I would say, needs very little introduction. As I remarked in a follow-up e email to subscribers, he has one of the, dis uh, the most distinguished and astonishingly productive CVs in the Western world. It really makes the rest of us um, feel perhaps shamed, perhaps a little guilty. Um, we'll get to the difference between shame and guilt when we, when we talk. Nonetheless, it is entirely appropriate to say a few words. From 1991 to 2013, he was the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth. And in 2009, he was named to the House of Lords. Um, he's the winner of many prizes, including most recently the Templeton Prize. Among his many books, depending on how you count, somewhere between two and three dozen, I'd point to tradition in an untraditional age, the dignity of difference, and the great partnership, which is on religion and science. Although most of his books have been aimed at an audience of both Jews and non-Jews, his new book, Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times, is perhaps his most ecumenical yet. It is a diagnosis of the dysfunctional common culture, or lack thereof, of Western democracies that is our common culture, along with a bracing prescription to, as he says, restore the common good. As such, it is really addressed to us all as Americans, Europeans, and so on. Although not surprisingly, it draws a great deal on classical Jewish texts and thinkers, some of whom I hope we'll discuss. Before we begin, uh, just a word to the audience. Rabbi Sachs and I will speak for about 35 minutes after which we'll have a brief question and answer period. To ask a question, and you can do this at any point, just go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and hit the, uh, the button that says questions and answers, or Q&A, and we'll get to as many as we can by the end of the period. For the, those of you among the Zoom cognoscente, do not click the button that says raise your hand. Just ask the question. Uh, there are just too many of you um, to, uh, to go through the calling on people who, who, as it were, raise their hand. Um, and finally, as the great Alex Trebek says, please do make sure it is in the form of a question. Okay, Rabbi Sachs. Hi there. Welcome to the Jewish Review of Books. I consider it a great privilege. You're a, a terrific magazine, really. Well, Thank you very much. And I, I very much enjoyed reading your book. So here in America, we're in the midst of, a, of the kind of divisive tribal election campaign whose rhetoric, um, not to speak of actual violence in the streets, is a, is a major symptom of the problems you're addressing. And yet you've argued um, that mixing politics and religion makes for bad politics and bad religion, I believe you said. How do you respond to those on the right and the left? And I have questions here from both sides who would argue that it's precisely here that somebody who believes in the necessity of religion returning as a bolster, at least for public morality, if not more, must take a stand on one political side or the other. By all means do so, but don't do so in a synagogue and don't do so in the name of a religion. You do so in the name of a synagogue, you desecrate sacred space by using it for secular purposes. Um, you do so in the name of religion, you show the world that you have not understood the first thing about religion. I mean, can you imagine, for instance, Jeremiah getting up in the center of Jerusalem and saying, vote Biden? Can you imagine Malachi saying, no! Vote Trump, he's good for Israel. I mean, my goodness, how tone deaf, how insensitive are you that you can confuse the essentially moral message of the prophets with the essentially political message of a presidential campaign? Jews shouldn't enter politics, by all means, enter politics but don't do so in the name of religion, don't do so in the synagogue, and if at all possible, do something else altogether. That something else altogether is described at the very heart of Alexis de Tocqueville's 
democracy in America. He, here he is, this young aristocrat, 1832, he's come from France, and he knows in France religion has a great deal of power, but zero influence. He comes to America and sees that it has no power at all because of separation of church and state, so he assumes it has zero influence. To his amazement, he finds exactly the opposite. It has no power, but enormous influence, so much so that he calls it the first of America's political institutions. He wants to understand how it happened. And he goes to lots and lots of ministers and he asks them. And they explain to him it happens because they don't talk politics in church. He asks them why. And they answer, because politics is divisive. And if we spoke politics in the church, the church would be divisive as well. We would rather remain a unifying factor in American life and let us renounce the politics, leave it to the politicians. I have been profoundly moved by that statement of Alexis de Tocqueville. Here I am, a member of the British Parliament. I sit in the House of Lords. So you say to me, Rabbi Sachs, how come you keep out of politics? The short answer is this. Number one, in the House of Lords, I sit on the cross benches. That is the place reserved for people of no party affiliation. Number two, when I speak, I do not speak on any issue that is party divisive. You can see that if you look at my speeches on YouTube, there are all the, many of them are there. And, and number three, I have been there for 11 years and I have not voted once because I say, I want a voice, not a vote. A voice is a matter of influence. A vote is a matter of power. And I do not see why I as a religious leader should be given an extra bit of power. Religion is not about power. It's about influence. So then, um, and yet, your, argument, your, your book makes a strong argument that the retreat of religion from, uh, from public life has been deleterious to morality, to our civil culture. Um, so how does that work exactly? And, and what would a positive return of morality, not politicking from the pulpit, but something else. How would that work? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly how it works. My argument is in the book is any society needs basically three arenas. There is two of them are competitive, the market and the state, the competition for wealth and the competition for power. Both are competitive, both are about I, both are about self-interest, and that's fine. No problem with that. But they have to be sustained by a third arena, the moral arena, which is about we, not I. It's about collective responsibility for the common good. Now that common arena, the moral arena, was historically undertaken by the church. Um, it was undertaken by the church one way in Britain through the established church and another way in America through this denominational religion, which is unique to America. And uh, they were very powerful agents of social change, very powerful. Um, but of course, uh, in Britain today, you have an almost totally secular society. And in America, you have an increasingly secular society because the fastest growing religious affiliation in America is none, which applies to at least 30% of young Americans. So a religion has kind of evacuated the public space. I mean, all you got to do is go back to a, somebody like Reinhold Niebuhr and the irony of American history, or even uh, a lay figure like the sociologist Robert Bella, you know, Beyond Belief, The Broken Covenant. These were the, uh, even, uh, even uh, what's it called, Habits of the Heart, his, 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 his book. You had religion in the public domain. Today, it's almost completely disappeared. 
And that answers your question, how come I wrote this book for almost everyone um, in a very non-Jewish way, in, a very, in which religion plays quite a small part in the book. Because I know by now, if you mention the R word, everyone switches off. Nobody's interested anymore. So I wrote this book to see if I could speak to people in terms that spoke to them without necessarily uh, utilizing religious language. Though I, th I think religion can do so much good if it so chooses. One of the hopeful themes in your book, um, and I wonder if this is in some tension with what you were just saying, is your hope for Generation Z, those born after 1995, as perhaps more we focused than I focused than immediately previous generations. Um, and yet that generation is, I, th I think if I'm not mistaken, um, more secular than ever. And it's also, um, it's also of course closest to the university campus where so much of what you decry the um, identity politics, the focus on victimization and so on, um, not to speak of even darker phenomena, um, anti-Semitism and so on, uh, are alive. So how do you see that? Mm -hmm. I don't know, to be honest with you, Abe. All I know is my most enthusiastic audience is a young people. That's all I can say. I did a five part series for the BBC on morality, uh, completely different from this book, where I got the really, really big names there, you know, whether it's Mike Sandel or Robert Putman or Jordan Peterson or Stephen Pinker or, you know, um, Gene Twenge, all these guys. Um, and these were the mega stars, but we decided uh, to include on the program. 17 and 18 year olds from four schools in Britain, interacting with those superstars, you know, giving their opinion mm -hmm. on the superstars' opinion. And I found uh, the 17, well, it wasn't just me, everyone called the 17 and 18 year olds the stars of the series. So they were serious, they were reflective, they were mature, and, and I love working with them, I really did. So I, I, I found it really, really easy to work with them because, you know, when, when need be, um, I can, you know, keep the religion thing as a very low profile. Religion remains an important source of values to immigrant groups in Britain, the Sikhs, the Hindus, the Muslims, and so on. Um, so with them, we could be a bit more religious, otherwise a bit less. What we're talking here is the politics of communication. I mean, I've written this book to try and make a difference. And so I try and enter people's mindset and speak to them where, where they can hear what I'm saying. And I have not found a problem with the young guys. Uh, but once you get caught up with the woke stuff and the virtue signaling stuff and the and the no platforming stuff and the cancel culture, that's a kind of closed box. And it's really hard to get people out of that box. Have you been no platformed? Uh, no. Thank heavens I'm not important enough. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the reason. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you something, you might find this interesting. You know that Jonathan Haidt, you obviously read yeah. the book. Um, Jonathan Haidt and uh, Greg Lukianoff wrote this yeah. book, The Coddling of the American Mind. When his English publisher uh, was about to publish the book in, in Britain, um, they said to me, would I join Jonathan in launching the book? And I said, of course. So we did an evening, big thousand people evening, center of London. And it's Jonathan and me, on the one hand, and a very, very radical feminist, and a very angry black guy on the other side, a professor of black studies at a British university. 
And his claim was, and he said it in these words again and again and again, Britain is founded on uh, racism, colonialism, and genocide. And he kept saying this every three minutes. Now, this did not endear him to the public. You do not pay 10 pounds or whatever it is to come and listen to a lecture to be told you're a racist and a colonialist and a committer of genocide. So after about 30 minutes of this stuff, I thought, you know, this is just plain boring. I didn't say this is just like America, but we were locked into our different boxes and nobody was moving anywhere. So I thought, okay, let's, let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. And I turned to him and I said, look, you know, when I was born, you know, my circumstances. So you know the way I feel and why I feel that way. But I have to say that had I been born when you were born, under the circumstances in which you were born, I might have come to exactly the same attitudes that you have today. So now let us see whether side by side we can find a better future together. Now at that moment I am told a kind of, of wave went, went through the audience. They were saying thank heaven somebody has broken through here and shown he's willing to cross sides in order to have a serious conversation. Um, and, and, and that did tell me uh, that you can sometimes break through even these really closed environments um, just by being willing to enter the mindset of somebody not like you. And, and did that spark a later conversation or, or was it just at the moment? It lightened up that evening to a, a much more engaged conversation. And, um, you know, my only concern at that point wasn't to save the world, but to sell um, Jonathan Haidt's books, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but, um, you know, it just, it just showed you what you can do. Um, of course, to create society-wide change, you need something a bit more rigorous than that. I, I mean, I, I recognize that. Speaking of selling good books, um, be before we get to questions, let's let's get back to um, one moment in your book that I thought was particularly striking, and it can bring us back to um, uh, to, to Bernard Williams too. Um, as you mentioned, one of his great books is is sh is Shame and Necessity, and this distinction between a shame culture and a guilt culture, these two kinds of moral cultures. It's a famous distinction which he deals with very sensitively. Oh. Um, I suppose, you know, archetypically, uh, ancient Greece is a shame honor culture and, and uh, ancient Israel is a, a, a guilt honor, uh, guilt merit culture, let's say. Yeah. Um, but he makes a very interesting, um, distinct distinction about hearing and seeing in, in terms of these two cultures, which then you turn into, despite this not being, as you say, a religious book, you then turn into a fascinating drasha. And I wonder if, especially since we're going to read uh, Parshat Breshit very soon and in, in a few weeks, um, you, could, you could explain that distinction and show how you read the, that Parsha or uh, yeah. That bit. Yeah. First of all, this is not in Bernard Williams, but and but it has to do with Yom Kippur, um, and that is that a guilt culture creates the possibility of atonement and forgiveness, because a guilt culture is predicated on a difference between the agent and the act. You know. Uh, Hate the sin, love the sinner. And therefore, despite the fact that you did a bad act, nonetheless, you can remain a pure human being. Um, the soul you gave me is pure, etc., etc. Hence the possibility of atonement and forgiveness. Shame culture is not like that, uh, because there is no distinction between 
act an agent and hence uh, 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 an offence. There is an indelible stain on your character, which is why if you were shamed, you committed harakiri, you became a Japanese war pilot, you, or you, if you were British, you uh, went off to Australia or South Africa where nobody knew you, etc., etc., because there's no way of cleansing shame. And that is why Yom Kippur is so essential in defining Judaism as not a shame culture. The second thing is that we have now become a well and truly shame culture once again. Another sign of our loss of the Judeo-Christian heritage. Uh, all this cancel culture stuff is um, essentially shame, not guilt. Right. If it were guilt, you could apologize and be forgiven. But once they've canceled you, there's no forgiveness. You're banished. So that, you're dead, you know. So, um, so that is that. Now, uh, Bernard Williams quotes, um, I've forgotten her name, Janet, somebody or other. It's Ruth Benedict, of course, who created this distinction. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that the thing about shame, it's, it's kind of visual. You imagine yourself being seen by other people. And hence, when you feel ashamed, the first thing you want to do is vanish underneath the floorboards. He says in a guilt culture, that doesn't help at all. Because even if you vanish underneath the, guilt, the uh, floorboards, the guilty voice in, inside of you is still there. Right. So um, shame is a visual phenomenon and guilt is, uh, is an oral one. Some, it's about what you hear. Now, having, bearing that in mind, um, I suddenly realized that if you look very carefully at the story of Adam and Eve and Eden and the serpent, you will see that almost all of it has to do with appearances. You know, um, they're naked and they're ashamed. You know, they, 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 they hide mm -hmm. from God because they think if we're hidden visually from God, he doesn't see us, he doesn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, the serpent, the snake says, serpent says, the day you eat from the fruit, your eyes will be opened. So this is a shame culture. And what Adam and Eve have done is they have opted for a, an ethic of the eyes instead of an ethic of the ear. The ear that hears God's command and the ear that responds to that command. Now, I don't know anyone's analyzed it that way, but if you look very, very carefully at the, word, at the wording, you will see it kind of works. Um, it says that they're intensely focused on seeing and being seen. That's marvelous. Um, I, I have so many more questions, but uh, but I know your time is short, and I also know that there are so many people who want to ask questions, and we were a little stalled early on with the technology. Let me get to a particularly striking one. This is from a man named Ezra Waxman. He writes, I am the survivor of a right-wing extremist attack which targeted Jews and Muslims. Soon I will be called upon to present my testimony in court and with an opportunity to speak directly to my perpetrator if I so choose. Do you have any advice as to how one might su use, utilize such a platform to lakade shem shemayim, to sanctify God's name? As the attack took place last Yom Kippur, I'm wondering if there might be a specific, specific message coming from the days of awe, which could be important for our society to hear. Oh my goodness me, my goodness me. I mean, it's, it's it's, you know, it's, it's terribly important in my humble opinion, first and foremost, for you to speak from your heart. You know, they, these extreme guys really lack a basic element of hum humanity. And it's just terribly important that they hear from you exactly 
what happened, or how you felt, how it's affected your life. That is extremely important. But I think it is equally important if you feel able to say this, that this happened on the holiest day of the Jewish year. And very often our enemies have chosen holy days on which to attack us. Certainly happened in Nazi Germany, and I have a strong suspicion it happened throughout the Middle Ages. And you have to stand up in court and say, I will not be intimidated. My people were around long before any of your people were, and we are still here. And the reason that we are still here is that we believe in the sanctity of life. And if you cannot recognize the sanctity of life, then society has no place for you. It's hard to know how to follow such a question, but there are, there are many more talking. Um, uh, a a follow-up question um, from Mario Flack, um, which is, uh, what, uh, what book, and in particular, what Jewish book um, particularly influenced you when you were, when you were writing this, this book? Now, this is a book for, uh, what do you call it? The left hand. <laughs> I, uh, and yet still, I, you know, Booker and Levinas and... Uh, oh, right. I'm oh, sorry. Which Jewish book in that sense? Yes. Absolutely no question. Uh, the book of Jeremiah. Mm. I mean, that's the key one. I mean, there are a lot of passages in Devarim Deuteronomy. There are a lot of passages in all the prophets, especially Amos, Amos, but Jeremiah above all. Jeremiah was politically intelligent. He had a far finer grasp of politics than any of his contemporaries. Jeremiah was a moral extremist, but he was a political moderate. He really was. He believed in making peace with the Babylonians, all the rest of it. He did not believe in fighting wars. He was not a zealot. He did the exact opposite. Politically, he was a moderate, which is why all the zealots wanted him killed, had him thrown into the pit, and so on and so forth. So he was politically wise and politically moderate. But those are tangential to what Jeremiah is all about. Jeremiah is telling us that unless a society is moral, it will fail. And the test of a society being moral is that people feel this is a good place to live. And in Jeremiah's day, they didn't feel this. They thought there was corruption, bribery, exploitation. The rich taking advantage of the poor, price fixing, you name it. And he was absolutely clear that um, a society that is not moral will not survive. Now, here is a man who lived quite a long life, who was simply not listened to, not heeded in his lifetime. And of course, in a, a famous chapter in Jeremiah, he says, I said to myself, I'm not going to prophesy anymore because it's brought me nothing but shame and humiliation the whole day long. But the word was within me like a burning fire and I could not contain it. So Jeremiah is the guy who tells us the fundamental truth. And it's very hard to say because when people are relatively affluent, they really don't give much of a damn about morality. And Jeremiah to me is the guy who said it all, saw it all, never lost hope. And uh, he was totally and absolutely the inspiration of this book. Two more questions, but I'll give them both to you and, and let you close on that. Uh, first, a reader who, who is anonymous, but who clearly read your book, says, 
that, that he or she couldn't help but notice and enjoy the use of humor and specifically Jewish jokes throughout morality. Um, given the prevalence of social media and its inherently dehumanizing nature, what place do you feel Jewish humor or other humor has as we reestablish a feeling of connectedness and obligation to each other? That's the first question. And the second question, uh, which comes from several people, so many that I won't do name names, is um, aside from reading your book, what practically can we as Jews and as citizens do now to restore the kind of society uh, at which you are aiming? Yeah, number one, humor in Judaism, absolutely fundamental. Um, there's a, I mean, of course, Ruth Weiss has written a book on this, uh, but actually the one I most enjoy was the sociologist, Peter Berger, mm. who wrote a little book called Redeeming Laughter. And uh, I, I, it's almost entirely about Jewish jokes. I think we laugh because otherwise we'd cry. It's that simple. Um, and I also found, if you're talking about humor, uh, we're talking about university days. Mm. The funniest people I ever met were the most brilliant academics I ever met. You know, um, Isaiah Berlin, for instance. I made Isaiah Berlin um, one of the judges in my Chief Rabbi's Award Scheme many years ago. And I said, Isaiah, you will decide who won the award four days before the award scheme. Whatever you do, don't tell anyone who won. And we were at a dinner together and I, I'm just sitting through the second course and Isaiah is telling everyone who won. <laughs> so I went up to him and I said, Isaiah, we said it's a secret. And he turned to me and he said, my dear boy, dear boy, I practice the Oxford way of keeping a secret. You only tell one person at a time. <laughs> <laughs> That's Isaiah Berlin. Bernard Williams had a wonderful sense of humor, et cetera, et cetera. The funniest of the lot was the Regis Professor of Roman Law at Oxford called David Dauber. I don't know if you ever came across David Dauber. He's the funniest guy ever. So these are brilliant, brilliant people. Um, so humor is an extreme, humor humanizes. Humor tells me that I can take that one reality and see it a different way. It's a kind of different way of doing uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. But it tells me I am not a prisoner of circumstance. So I say humor is first cousin to hope. And I thought I was dealing with such a heavy subject that I had to put a little bit of humor in the book. I wish I'd put a bit more in, but at any rate, a little bit. So thank you for noticing. Uh, the second question, what can we do to make a difference? The truth is you and I and every one of us can make a difference. Because all we have to do is reach out to one other person in an act of kindness. As soon as it is safe to do so, or at two meters distance, if it isn't safe to do so, wearing a mask, go out there and do, number one, visit the sick. Number two, as soon as it's possible, open your house to hospitality. Number three, get in touch with the people who are isolated and who are feeling vulnerable and alone. Number four, volunteer. Number five, get engaged in some kind of local charity. Now I have to tell you, and I think I hint this in the book, that this will have a direct positive benefit on your health. We know now that doing good is actually good for you. And it strengthens the immune system, for instance. It's an extremely powerful medical phenomenon. Um, and uh, volunteering in particular, um, the second you do this, you discover something we may have forgotten during the pandemic, which is 
that good things are contagious, not just bad things. And that's the only way we change the world. One life at a time, one day at a time, one act at a time, focusing on the people who are close to us or the opportunities that are close to us and resolve that in the coming year, you will do one extra commitment by way of volunteering or helping others. And as I say, it will be good for them, it will be good for you, and it will help begin to change the tone of society. Well, that's, um, it's hard to know a better, uh, a better note on which to end. The book is Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times. Rabbi Sachs, uh, I thank you for persevering through technological difficulties and, and for your eloquence. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure and I hope to continue at some later date.